Hi everybody, this is lesson 14, entitled Order Lepidoptera. And guys, this is our final lesson for flying creatures of the fifth day for exploring with zoology. We have finally made it, as amazing as it is. The sight of butterflies often elicits wonder and excitement. How many times have you seen a butterfly and felt the need to simply gaze at it? Probably only the girls, but that's okay. That's the response many people have when they encounter a butterfly. In fact, some people call butterflies flying flowers because of their beauty. And I would be inclined to agree with them too. Learning about these flying flowers is our last quest in zoology one. Very last one. And I think you will find them as fascinating as many of the other animals you have learned about in this book, if not more so. Why are these wonderful insects called butterflies? There are many possibilities, but no one knows for sure. Some say that people started using the phrase flutterby to describe how they fly. And the phrase was eventually corrupted into butterfly. Butterfly, flutterby. Sounds close. In England, many of these in insects are yellow, like butter. Some people say they were called butter-colored flies, and that eventually got shortened to butterflies. However, the name came to be. We will call them leps in this book, because that's the nickname given to butterflies, moths, and skippers by those who study them. Because this insect belonged in order Lepidoptera, those who study them are called Lepidopterus. Lepidoptera means scale wings, and that's a good description of these insects because of the overlapping scales that cover their wings. These scales are so tiny and fragile, they look like little hairs. But when you touch a lep's wing, the scales can actually be rubbed off. When they come off, they look like a fine powder. The scales are what give leps their beautiful colors. Some people say that if you rub the scales off a lep's wing, it can't fly. This is just a myth, however. A butterfly can fly with just half a wing, so missing a few scales certainly doesn't hurt it. Order Lidoptera has more species than any other order except Cleoptera, which contains the beetles. Just like beetles, there are probably thousands of undiscovered leps in the world, especially in tropical rainforests. Tr rainforests. Every year, new species of moths and butterflies are discovered. There are many leps, but there's not enough researchers to discover them all. Perhaps someday you'll be a lead-up tourist that discovers new species of butterflies, moths, or skippers. Have you ever heard of skippers? I have not. They are overlooked by most people, but you have probably seen them more often than you realize. Skippers are smaller than most butterflies, but their bodies are generally fatter in comparison to their wings than are the bodies of most butterflies. Because of their fat bodies, and often drab colors. Skippers are sometimes mistaken for moths. However, they are not moths or butterflies. They are skippers. You can usually tell a skipper by its antennae, which are often curled into an upside down J at the end. They also skip when they fly, which is how they got the name skipper. Their flight patterns look like a stone skipping the surface of the water. Look for them this summer. Flitting from one dandelion to another. I don't know if we have those here, but that would be a good question. Leps are very important pollinators. Many flowers are only pollinated by leps. This is because the petal isn't large enough landing pad for a bee. And the flower's tube is so long that only a lep's long proboscis can reach down to extract the nectar within. There's so many flower, there are many flower producing plants that would not exist today without certain leps that pollinate them. Remember that without pollination, a plant cannot produce seeds, which means that it would go extinct. In fact, there are some plants that depend on a specific lep for pollination. One such plant is the yucca plant. It depends on a specific moth, and guess what that moth is called? 
you probably guessed it, the yucca moth. You see, a female yucca moth will arrive at a yucca flower, collect some of its pollen, and shape the pollen into a little pellet. She would then travel to another flower on yet another yucca plant and rub the pollen against the part of the flower that needs it, which completes the pollination process. After that is done, she would place one or two eggs in the flower. The egg or eggs hatch. The larvae, little caterpillars, will feed on the seeds, but they do not eat all of them. Instead, they leave some alone so the seeds can become new yucca plants. When the larvae are ready to enter into their pupa stage, they drop from the flower and burrow into the ground. They surround themselves with silken, cocoon, silken cocoons that are usually covered with sand or dirt. Usually, they overwinter and, in the cocoons and emerge as adults in the spring, just when the flowers on the yucca plant are in bloom. This is important because the adults only live for a few days. So, if they emerge from their cocoons too soon, there would be no flowers to pollinate and eggs to lay in. Although this is the typical life cycle of the yucca moth, the caterpillars have the incredible ability to delay their development into adults by as many as 30 years, if conditions require it. Creation confirmation. Think about how well the yucca plant and the yucca moth work together so that both of them can reproduce. The yucca moth somehow knows that in order for its larvae to have something to eat, the yucca flower in which it lays its eggs must be pollinated. Because of this, it carries pollen from the flower of one plant to the flower of another to ensure that pollination occurs. It also places its eggs only in empty flowers. If the yucca, yucca moth sees eggs already inside a flower, it will not leave eggs there. Otherwise, there would be too many caterpillars when the eggs hatched and they would consume all the seeds of the yucca plant. That, of course, would keep the yucca plant from reproducing. Once the eggs hack, the caterpillars somehow know to eat only a few of the seeds, leaving the rest to become new plants. That's not the end of the story, however. Once the caterpillars leave the yucca plant and form their cocoons, they somehow know exactly how long to stay in the pupa stage. They don't emerge until the yucca plant has made flowers. They emerge too soon, they would die before they pollinated the plants. If they emerge too late, the flowers would be gone, and once again, they would not be able to pollinate the plants. Neither one of these things happens. Instead, the yucca plant life cycle and yucca moth life cycle are perfectly coordinated with each other. Clearly, this relationship could not have come by chance. Just like a television and a remote control, the yucca moth and the yucca plant have been designed to work together. Since it is obvious that the television and the remote control are made by an intelligent designer, it should be clear that the yucca moth and the yucca plant have been made by the most intelligent designer of them all. Lep anatomy. All leps have the same basic body features, a head, thorax, abdomen, and scaly wings. Leps have antennae, which are used for smell, touch, and navigation. The head is equipped with two compound eyes. Most leps cannot see the color red, but they are capable of seeing colors like orange, yellow, blue, and violet. They can also see a certain type of light that we cannot see, called ultraviolet light. Have you ever wondered why a moth will fly in circles around a light at night? Well, scientists have wondered that too, and they're not sure. One possible explanation is that a moth tends to use the light of the moon to navigate at night. Since the moonlight comes from a fixed point far away, it can judge where it's going by keeping the moon at the same side of its body during its flight. However, when there is another light that looks brighter than the moon, like your porch light, a moth will try to use it as its guide. If the moth, get, moth gets too close, it looks like the light is coming from all directions. This confuses the moth forcing it to fly in circles. We don't know that this is the correct explanation, but it's a possible one. If you become a lepidopterist, maybe you will find out whether it's true or not. Antennae. How can you tell when a lep is a skipper, a moth, or a butterfly? Well, 
One way is to look at it and at its antennae. The antennae of a butterfly are two long stalks with swollen ends. Often, these ends are so swollen they look like little knobs. The antennae of skippers, on the other hand, are usually curved into the shape of a J at the end. The antennae of a moth often look feathery and typically don't have a knob at the end. Even if the antennae do not look featherly, featherly, feathery, the lep is still most likely a moth if they do not have swollen ends. Like most insects, leps use their antennae for smell and touch. They also have a special organ at the base of each antennae called the Johnston's organ. This organ helps them maintain balance and orientation, especially while in flight. Most insects have this organ at the base of each antennae. Drinking straws. Adult leps eat nectar. Contrary to popular belief, adult moths don't eat clothing. Some species of moth, however, do have larvae that eat clothing. Not surprisingly, the leps that have such larvae are called cloth moths. Unlike chewing insects, most leps don't have a mouth that opens and closes. Instead, a lep usually has a long proboscis that uncurls when it lands on a flower or other food source. A mosquito has a long probis proboscis, but it ha also has mouth parts that pierce into the food source so the proboscis can be dipped into the fluid that the mosquito wants to be. Nasty little creatures. Because of this, we sometimes say that the mosquito has piercing, sucking mouthing parts. A let does not have piercing mouth parts. It has only sucking mouth parts for nectar. When it feeds, it gently unfurls its proboscis and drinks its food, usually nectar, the way we drink from a straw. Although adult butterflies and skippers are hungry when they emerge from the pupa stage, they won't eat unless it's warm enough. They can't even fly around looking for flowers unless their bodies are warm enough. This is why you typically see them flying around flowers later in the day when it's warm. If it's not quite warm enough for them to fly, however, they can warm themselves up by sitting in the sun and shivering their wings, moving them up and down quickly. If you happen to raise butterflies indoors, you will probably see them shivering because most of us don't keep our homes warm enough for them to fly and eat. Butterflies tend to land on a flower to drink its nectar, as, it, as shown in the picture above. While moths often hover around the flower like a hummingbird, as shown in the picture to the left. In fact, one kind of moth is often mistaken for a hummingbird that it's called the hummingbird moth. I got to see that in Hawaii. In Europe, people sometimes report seeing hummingbirds, even though there were no wild hummingbirds in that part of the world. Most likely, they either saw a hummingbird that escaped captivity or a hummingbird moth. Thorax. Being behind a lep's head is its thorax, of course. Like all insects, lep's wings and legs attach to it. Each leg is segmented with the tar tarsus at the end. Do you remember what a tarsus is? It's an insect's foot. The tarsi, the plural of tarsus, of butterfly, are very helpful since they have little sensors on the bottom that can taste. Imagine you could taste with your feet. That would probably, my feet would be atrocious by the different things it would taste. It wouldn't be good for us humans. I bet you would never walk outside without your shoes on. Unless, of course, you had a patch of flowers. And then, even then, I don't think I'd like the taste of my shoes. A lep's tarsi, tarsi also have claws that help it grasp the surface on which it lands. Butterflies use them when they land on flowers to feed, for example. Moths use them to cling to almost anything while they rest during the day. Some butterflies, like the painted lady monarch, have front legs that are so tiny it looks like they only have four legs. These butterflies are typically called brush-footed butterflies. Of course, if they really only had four legs, they would not be insects. All it Insects have how many legs? I hope you said six. However, if you examine them carefully, you will see the first set of legs tucked next to the body. They use them as brushes for cleaning their antennae and eyes. That's why they're called brush-footed butterflies. Lefts have four wings, two front wings, called fore wings, and two back wings, called hind wings. As I mentioned, lep wings are covered with scales that overlap one another. The scales are what form the pattern we see on a lep's wings. Some butterflies actually have patterns on the wings that look like letters in the alphabet or numbers. Can you guess what pattern the, the question mark has on its wing? 
Next time you see a butterfly, look to see if there's a pattern on its wing that resembles characters you have seen before. Migration. Most butterflies spend their entire lives in the area where they hatched, but there are some exceptions. One of the most interesting exceptions is the monarch butterfly. This incredible butterfly migrates up to 2,500 miles from the farthest reaches of North America all the way down to central Mexico. This was discovered by Dr. Fred Urquhart of the University of Toronto. He knew the monarchs migrated because he would stop seeing them after a certain time of the year. He didn't know where they went, however, so he clipped a little tag on every monarch he could. On this tag was his name, address, and a request to send him the butterfly if it was found. Within a few months, butterflies were returned to him from all over North America and even Mexico. Aha! He had a clue. Mexico was the southernmost area from which he had gotten a butterfly return. So he just started traveling there to look for the monarchs. For many years, he traveled to Mexico, where he climbed through the jungles, tromped through forests, and talked to the people he found. He eventually heard there was a place west of Mexico City where people had seen large numbers of monarchs altogether. He had searched and searched for this place, and he eventually found it. There they were, millions of monarch butterflies covering every square inch of the area. There were so many monarchs that the trees looked like orange and black from top to bottom. While in Mexico, the monarchs cling to everything they can find, trees, bushes, and even each other. This result in layer upon layer of resting monarchs in a state of hibernation. They stay like that from November through mid-March, at which time they head back home, laying eggs along the way. Most never make it all the way home. But when the eggs hatch, pupate, and become butterflies, they will continue the journey north to the place where their sp parents spent the summer. Isn't that amazing? Scientists have found out that some monarch butterflies, especially those that live west of the Rocky Mountains, don't travel all the way to Mexico for winter. Instead, they spend the winter in Southern California. The other butterflies that migrate, including the Painted Lady, Red Admiral, and Common Buckeye, but their flights are not as long and don't end with millions in one spot. More metamorphosis. As you have already learned, leps go through complete metamorphosis. They begin as a tiny egg, sometimes smaller than the period at the end of this sentence. They hatch as caterpillars and molt in order to grow, form a chrysalis or a cocoon, and transform into an amazing winged creature. Have you been searching for eggs since you began your study of insects? If not, yeah, you should be able to find some around this time of year. Start searching on the side of leaves wherever you go out. Insect eggs, including lep eggs, may be found in clusters on individually or on one leaf. They can be as small as a speck of dust or as large as a pea. Some caterpillars lay eggs that are so tiny you will need a magnifying glass to see them clearly. If you find an egg, you will try to raise it using half day. That, I don't, well, I don't know if you guys would be able to, but it would be awesome if you did. You can make a butterfly habitat. Within a few weeks, the caterpillar hatches from the egg. It's a very tiny creature that only has simple eyes to discern light from dark. Do you remember what those simple eyes are called? They're called oculi. Most caterpillars have a total of six oculi. They also have two antennae. Sometimes the antennae are not very noticeable and can shrink back into the body when the caterpillar is touched. Below the antennae are the chewing mouth parts. If you listen closely, you can sometimes hear caterpillars munch, munch, munch on the leaves in the stillness of the night. Below their mouths are tiny silk-producing organs called spinnerets. The moth and skipper caterpillars use them to form a cocoon, a cocoon to enter their pupa stage. Since a caterpillar has only oculi, no compound eyes, it can't see anything but light and dark. If that's the case, then how does it find food? Well, thankfully, the lep that laid its egg is programmed by God to know where to lay the egg eggs and she lays them right on the foot uh, right on the food that the caterpillar will need to eat that way the caterpillar hatches right where it needs to be its first meal is often its own egg case then it goes about eating the plant on which it's hatched it usually crawls up to the top of the plant first god designed caterpillars to crawl up because that's where the freshest newest most tender leaves are found on the <coughs> excuse me on the plant now you might be wondering about how the caterpillar no knows which way is up after all it can't really see can only sense light and dark. 
How does it know which way to crawl to get to the top of the top of a plant? Well, God might have programmed its crawl opposite of gravity. Do you know what gravity is? I'm sure you do. It is the force that pulls you down toward the earth so you don't go flying off into space. When you drop a ball, it falls to the ground because gravity pulls it that way. Since gravity pulls things toward the ground, if a caterpillar crawls opposite of gravity, it'll be crawling up. That's not toward that's not the only possible explanation, however. Perhaps God programmed caterpillars to crawl toward light. Since the sun is in the sky, does a caterpillar crawl up a plant because it's headed toward the sun? This is a great question, and you will find the answer to it in the experiment if you're able to find an egg from a caterpillar. If so, that would be awesome. Start thinking about, well, let's go, let's go on. Caterpillars with their simple eyes and tiny legs aren't fast enough to escape predators. Most have some sort of defense. Do you remember some of the interesting defenses that caterpillars have? Some look and behave like snakes, and some have huge eye spots. Others are protected by their ability to blend in with their food source. In other words, they are camouflaged. Some look like bird droppings, while others look like twigs. The wavy line Wavy lined emerald moth caterpillar can be found biting off pieces of the flower in its eating and sticking it on its back. Hmm. This makes it blend in with the flower. Cool. Some caterpillars also taste bad to most predators or are toxic. Most, many caterpillars even have poisonous spikes on their bodies. These spikes look like hair but are actually hollow tubes with needle like tips that poke into the predator. These tubes are filled with irritating or poisonous fluid. Fluid. When, whether or not caterpillar has poisonous spikes, it does have hair-like projections that cover its body. It uses these hairs to sense things about its surroundings. Do you remember what the sensory hairs in the insect are called? They are called setae. Some caterpillars appear smooth and shiny, but if you look closely with a magnifying glass, you'll see the setae. Like all insects, a caterpillar has a head, thorax, and abdomen. You might have a hard time finding them, but they are there. The head is usually the easiest spot. The thorax is made up of three segments right behind the head. This is where you'll find the caterpillar's six legs. It's six true legs, that is. These true legs are called thoracic legs. Thoracic legs. Since they are attached to the thorax. Many caterpillars appear to have more than six legs. But because they have little extra appendages called prolegs, which are not true legs. These prolegs have tiny hooks called crochets that can be used to grasp onto things. Caterpillars, therefore, use their legs to grip the surfaces on which they crawl. Most caterpillars have five pairs of prolegs. Have you ever seen an inchworm? Believe it or not, inchworms are not worms. They're caterpillars. These Specific caterpillars have only two or three pairs of prolegs, so they, most, they must crawl along a bit differently from other caterpillars. An inchworm holds on with its true legs and draws its abdomen towards its head. This causes its body to curl into an upside-down U. It then grasps with its prolegs and lets, it, lets go with its true legs, pushing the front of the body forward until its body is flat again. It then grips with its true legs, lets go with its prolegs, and draws its abdomen forward, starting the process all over again. With powerful mandibles, eating and eating, and more eating, is about all a caterpillar wants to do. It eats, gets bigger, then molts. Eats, gets bigger, then molts. And so on until it's a large caterpillar ready to enter its pupa stage. Most butterfly caterpillars will molt four or five times, leaving behind a crumpled exoskeleton each time. Stages in between these molts are called instars. Notice the two caterpillars on the child's arm. They're in two different instars. You can tell because they look noticeably different from one another. The larger one looks like it might be in its last instar, almost ready to enter its pupa stage. Cocoon. Once a caterpillar has reached its last instar and is ready to enter its pupa stage, there is a big difference between a moth caterpillar and a butterfly caterpillar. Do you remember what the difference is? Moths usually spin a cocoon to enter the pupa stage. While butterflies usually form a chrysalis. Let's start by discussing moths. 
When a moth enters the pupa stage, it releases silk from the spinnerets under its mouth, spinning the silk into a cocoon that surrounds it. Some even fasten leaves to their cocoons so they are camouflaged while in their pupa stage. Although most moths make cocoons out of silk, the silk moth, also called the silkworm moth, produces an especially strong kind of silk from its spinnerets. This silk has been woven into fabric for thousands of years to make silk garments. The Chinese were the first to discover how to make garments several thousand years ago. They kept it a secret. They kept the secret to this amazingly soft, tough fabric for thousands of years. Only the emperors, their families, and certain servants knew how it was produced. Anyone suspected of telling the secret was immediately beheaded. This went on for thousands of years. Talk about a family tradition. Silk is a wonderful fabric because it's soft and allows air to flow through it. This makes it feel light and comfortable. Because it was so wonderful, and few people knew how to make it, silk used to be available only to the wealthy and powerful. About 1,500 years ago, though, however, Christian monks snuck silk moths out of the country in their hollow walking sticks, and the secret of silk making was revealed to the rest of the world. Now silk can be purchased by normal people, but it is still expensive. That's because it takes a lot of silk moth cocoons to make silk fabric. For example, it takes over 100 cocoons to make one tie. Does your father have any silk ties? Estimate how many silk moth cocoons it took to make the tie in his closet. That's a lot of caterpillars and a lot of cocoons. The silk moth caterpillar is often called the silkworm, but it's not a worm at all. How do we make silk from its cocoon? Well. Once the silk moth caterpillar spins its cocoon, the silk maker dunks it in hot water and unravels the silk thread from the cocoon. This means that the caterpillar is sacrificed for the cocoon. Of course, if a silk maker did that with all of his cocoons, he wouldn't have any silk moth caterpillars left to make more silk. So some cocoons are left alone so that the caterpillars can become adults and mate. That way, there will always be more silkworms. Interestingly enough, because silk moths have been used for produ producing silk for so many years, the entire species has lost the ability to fly. You see, the adults are fed the mulberry leaves they need, to be, they need by silk makers, so they don't need to use their wings to forage for food. As a result, whether or not a silk moth could fly did not affect whether or not it would live. If a flightless silk moth had been born in the wild, it would have died without producing offspring because of its inability to care for itself. But not so in the silk maker's care. In captivity, flightless silk moths are preferred because they don't try to escape. Eventually, after thousands of years, all silk moths became flightless, even though they still have wings. Chrysalis. A butterfly caterpillar is able to produce silk, but doesn't use the silk to make a cocoon. Instead, it finds a nice place for wh from which to hang. In some species, it just clasps on with its last pair of prolegs. In other species, it spins some silk into a pad that's attached to where it will hang. It then attaches a little hook on the top of its abdomen, called a cream, cream, cremaster, to the pad. No matter how it attaches itself, the caterpillar will hang upside down and begin its final molt. In this mold, the caterpillar sheds its exoskeleton, and the new exoskeleton underneath looks quite different from its previous exoskeleton. When exposed to the air, this new exoskeleton hardens, and that's the chrysalis. So rather than being something that the caterpillar covers itself in, like a cocoon, a chrysalis is a special exoskeleton. It is the exoskeleton that appears only for the pupa stage. The chrysalis hangs there so quiet and still, yet... This is very deceptive. Inside the chrysalis, drastic things are happening. Every aspect of the caterpillar's body is changing into an adult butterfly. When conditions outside the chrysalis are favorable and all the necessary changes have taken place, the chrysalis will break open. If the chrysalis formed in the fall, it might overwinter until spring before this happens. When the chrysalis split, the new adult butterfly struggles out sits quietly for hours, pumping fluid into its wings to expand them. 
When its wings are fully expanded, it is ready for flight. The first order of business is to look for food. Then it will be ready to mate. How long do leps live? It's most common for an adult lep to live only a one or two weeks because it lived most of its life as a caterpillar or a pupa. However, there are some leps that have a much longer adult life. Adult zebra heliconian butterflies live in warm climates, for example, can live for several months. Adult monarch butterflies live up, for, up to nine months. Of course, monarchs must live longer than most adult butterflies in order to make the incredible migration you learned about earlier. Though most adults live only for a few weeks, the pupa and egg stage may last far more than a year. For some species, the entire life cycle will be as short as one month. Though this is a short life, the good news is that short-lived leps can reproduce rapidly, and there can be several generations of young in one summer. What's the difference? Now that you've learned about leps and their life cycles, let's concentrate on the difference, differences among leps. Remember, order Lidoptera has butterflies, skippers, and moths. Can you name a few of the differences among these three types of leps? Let's start with the antennae. You already learned that a butterfly's antennae are long with thickened or knobbed ends, knobbed ends. A skipper's antennae are usually curved into a J at the end, and a moth's antennae are often feather, feathery and usually don't have knobs at the end. There are other general differences as well. Butterflies and skippers usually hold their wings up while they rest, while moths usually hold their wings flat while resting. This generally means that the moth's body is covered by its wings when it is at, when it is at rest. In addition, the bodies of butterflies are thinner than those of moths and skippers. Finally, moths are generally drab, while butterflies are usually quite colorful. You can sometimes distinguish leps by watching how they behave. Moths usually hover next to the flower to drink from its nectar, while butterflies and skippers often land on the flower. In addition, most moths are nocturnal, active at night, while most butterflies are diurnal, active during the day. Finally, butterflies generally form a chrysalis in their pupa stage, while moths and skippers usually spin cocoons around themselves. Now, it's important to understand that while these are general rules I have just discussed are helpful in determining whether a lep is a moth, butterfly, or skipper, they are not foolproof. There are exceptions to nearly every one of these rules. Consider, for example, the luna moth, pictured above. It is a moth, but it's not drab at all. In fact, it's quite beautiful. It does have the feathery antenna of a moth. However, it does not hold its wing flat while at rest. Try this. Identify each lep in the picture below as a butterfly, moth, or skipper. The correct, well, you guys can figure it out. You don't need to know the answers. You'll be able to get it right off. A Venn diagram compares and contrasts different things. Make your own Venn diagram to compare and contrast Butterflies and moths. Write the things that butterflies and moths have in common in the overlapping part of the diagram and record those things that are different in the ovals outside the overlapping part. Place your Venn diagram in your notebook. So there will be a page provided in your journal. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of the book. So don't forget to finish up your last minute stuff in your journals and I hope you have a wonderful day.